large brain to house an extensive mental map. Or again, if you're extracting food from a matrix, such as tubers from the earth or nuts from shells, you need a large brain to help you figure out how to do it. Yet, non-human foragers, with their comparatively small brains, seem to be able to manage all these things perfectly well. They know where to go to find food, they don't get lost, and they're quite clever at extracting resources from all sorts of difficult spots. So by a process of elimination, this leaves us with the social explanation as the only possibility left. And as I've shown, Dunbar was certainly not the first to argue that the demands of living with conspecifics placed a positive selective pressure on the evolution of intelligence. The one thing that was innovative in his argument lay in his suggestion that these social demands could be correlated with the size of the group. Specifically, the larger the group, the greater the number of relationships that an, in that an individual would have simultaneously to manage, and the more information about these relationships the individual has to be able to process and manipulate. There is thus, Dunbar argues, an information processing bottleneck which limits the size of the social group to what the brains of its individual members can handle. As brain size is increased, so the neck of the bottle gradually enlarged, and with it, the sizes of groups in which individuals were able to live. And it seems, according to his calculations and a certain manipulation of the evidence, that in all modern humans, it has reached the magic number of 150. But uh, over the last decade, Dunbar has been vigorously promulgating his social brain hypothesis with some considerable success. It has all the ingredients of a good scientific story. It's also, in my view, complete nonsense. The hypothesis is misconceived in at least three respects. First of all, it rests on a false opposition between social and ecological relations. Secondly, it assumes that the workings of the mind can be equated with the operation of neural machinery internal to the organism. And thirdly, in treating the brain as a computational organ, it divides, divides the brain from the body that allegedly responds to its commands. This is effectively neuro-Cartesianism. So let me start with the opposition between the social and the ecological. The question is, how do we stake out the domain of social relations? And on what grounds can we distinguish, if indeed at all, relations that are social from relations that are not? Now, for most social anthropologists, and at least until quite recently, it's kind of gone without saying that social relations are human relations. Indeed, this equation is presupposed in the very constitution of our discipline, because only if social relations are human relations can the study of social relations be an aspect of the study of humanity. And that's what we social anthropologists claim to do. The mark of the social, it's commonly thought, lies in personal qualities of agency and intentionality, feeling, memory and speech, that are brought to bear in the formation of relationships and that are intrinsic to the kinds of beings we call human. We say that a being is human, we reckon that it's got those kinds of qualities. If an animal possessed these qualities, well then we'd be tempted to call it human too, even though it might not be regarded as an individual of the human species. People in Western societies, for example, often say this of their pets, particularly dogs. The pet dog, is taken to be a character with intentions and feelings of its own, who knows its human companions well and responds intelligently to the sounds of their voices. So we say, well, it's a dog. I know it's a dog, but it's well, a human as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yet, yet companion animals might be taken as the exception that proves the rule because it seems that we can enter into social relations with non-human animals only to the extent that through close association something of our humanity has, so to speak, rubbed off on them, transforming them almost into honorary humans. Indeed, cynics might argue that in treating pets as persons, we're indulging in an elaborate anthropomorphic 
pretense. From there, however, it's but a short step to the conclusion that social relations are human relations because they're with individuals who belong, whether in reality or the imagination, to the same species as we do. To take this step is, in effect, to convert what was a purely contingent aspect of social relations, that is, the species membership of participants, into their defining feature. But once we've taken this step, it's a step which lies in the slippage from the existential condition of being human, with all the stuff about intentionality, memory, and so on, to the taxonomic attribution of human being, homo sapiens. Once we take that step, the path is clear to extend the concept of the social to cover the interactions that any kind of creature, human or non-human, has with its conspecifics. For me, taking this line, social relations are human relations because I happen to be a human being. If I were an ant, then my social relations would be with other ants, not with humans. Humans would simply be part of the physical environment, whereas my social relations are with other ants. Just as a, as a human, I say my social relations are with other humans, ants, they're just part of the physical environment. Now, it's in just this derivative sense, connoting relations among conspecifics, that the notion of society was taken up in the writings of sociobiologists and other students of animal behaviour. It goes back to E.O. Wilson's famous text on sociobiology, where he defines society as a group of individuals belonging to the same species and organised in a cooperative manner. Nothing there about intentions or memory or feeling or anything like that. Following Wilson's leads, sociobiologists have made it their business to describe and explain the varieties of social behaviour across every branch of the animal kingdom. And they insist that human sociality, for all its distinctiveness and complexity, is just one variant of a widespread phenomenon whose study should represent a particular specialty within a much broader, more inclusive science. And that science, of course, for them, is evolutionary biology. But whatever successes evolutionary biologists might have had in accounting for patterns of cooperative or altruistic behaviour in terms of its consequences for reproductive fitness, their explanations take us nowhere in understanding those qualities of intentionality, sentience, memory and speech that seem to us to be so central to the experience of social being. Indeed, sociobiological explanations carry force only to the extent that these qualities can be relegated to the status of epiphenomenal byproducts of more fundamental behaviour generating programmes. It's rather ironic, actually, to reflect that the identification of society with the domain of intraspecific interactions, which underwrites the sociobiological enterprise, came about only thanks to an original assumption, which sociobiologists categorically reject, <coughs> that society is the unique preserve of humankind. Because we originally think, oh, it's just humans who are social, and then say, okay, society is a product of interactions among members of the human species, therefore society is interactions among conspecifics, therefore we've got something social whenever you see interactions among conspecifics, whether humans or ants. And the thing turns it over, and it's kind of somersault. Now, of course, socio sociobiologists are not the only people to have claimed that non-human animals can enjoy a social life. The... Uh, Understanding is widely reported, for example, in the ethnography, with which I happen to be familiar, of northern native hunters uh, around the, the circumpolar region in northern North America, uh, northern Europe and Siberia. The understanding that animals form communities of their own, much like human ones. But for these hunting peoples, the socio sociality of animals owes nothing to the fact that they are of the same species. Animals are social not because they cooperate with others of their own kind, but because they are thought to reveal in their actions the same qualities of intentionality, feeling, memory, and indeed speech that humans do. This is what makes it possible for humans to have relationships with them. 
So one doesn't have to regard animals as people in Western societies sometimes regard their pets 